And that couldn't but concern anyone about his health. And I was very concerned about that. Back in Washington, the president continued to behave strangely. I was uh, walking up the stairway in the west wing of the White House when suddenly somebody came down the stairs two at a time and bowled me over. And he was followed by six other people. I suddenly realized, my God, that was the president of the United States and uh, running away from six Secret Service agents. And the look in his eye was one of desperation, and that bothered me. There was even concern that the president or White House staff might try to ring the White House with troops. And about that time, uh, my assistant secretary for public affairs, Joe Layton, came to the office. And I said, if I were in your place, I would want to know what the nearest combat-ready troops were that would take orders directly from the president and not bother with the chain of command. The nearest troops were stationed just three and a half miles from the White House. Uh, he looked with concern at the Marine barracks just on the outskirts of Washington. He also looked at the 82nd Airborne, crack troops based in North Carolina, and he was told that they could be operational in Washington within about five hours. I understand Schlesinger has said that the very idea of having one set of American troops around the White House and having to, to bring in other troops to counter them would have been, in his words, a, a bloody mess. An unprecedented order was issued. Defense Secretary Schlesinger wanted to ensure that no extraordinary instructions to the military would be carried out. I told the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff that every order that would come from the White House had to come to me directly, uh, immediately upon receipt. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs called a meeting of the Joint Chiefs, and his hands were shaking visibly. And he said, I've just come from the office of the Secretary of Defense. He wanted an agreement from the Joint Chiefs, all of them, that nobody would take any action or execute orders, as they call it, on the use of a nuclear weapons without all of them agreeing to it. And we, we were shocked. He said, but we all agreed. We would receive countersigned, top secret, eyes only, limited distribution messages stating that we should not obey orders until further noticed. In a situation this tragic and this volatile and this emotional, um, all sorts of speculation and stability rumors can, can uh, uh, you know, spread. Uh, I believe it was inappropriate for uh, uh, Secretary Schlesinger to issue such an order. The president was the duly elected man in office, and it is not the uh, responsibility of uh, his cabinet officers to uh, question whether or not he's balanced, save when there is clear, clear evidence that he is no longer capable of the job. At the end of July, it became clear that Nixon would have to resign or face impeachment. In his last days at the White House, some feared that he might attempt suicide. The president was in, in a very difficult position. Uh, his health had been affected. He said to me, you know, Al, in the old days and in your profession, uh, the visitor would leave a pistol in the desk drawer, and he knew what would happen with that pistol. Haig ordered the president's doctors to remove any pills he might have. I don't think anyone other than his immediate family, his wife and his children, uh, understood as I did the strains that he was under and the pressures he was facing as he approached a decision to resign. I think that he gradually buckled under that stress. I was amazed at the end that he was able to continue 
his life through the end of the presidency. Everything he had worked for uh, all his life was collapsing, and deep down he knew that he had made a big contribution to its collapse. So they walk in, and the staff is drenched in tears. It's all over. And uh, Mrs. Nixon stood next to her husband and the two daughters and the sons-in-law. And throughout his speech, which is about as impassioned as I've ever heard a president, I mean, it came right from the soul, the gut, the heart. He mentioned his mother, sainted mother, his father. But he was a great man. Because he did his job, and every job counts, up to the hilt regardless of what happened. <clears throat> Nobody will ever write a book, probably, about my mother. Well, I guess all of you would say this about your mother. My mother was a saint. He just, just got carried away and er everything thrust back to, you know, I tried so hard for the country. When you take some knocks, some disappointments, when sadness comes, because only if you've been in the deepest valley can you ever know how magnificent it is to be on the highest mountain. There were several times when he almost broke down. Uh, but each time he gathered his strength and he went on and uh, through to the end. I kept hoping, I was sitting in the front row, I kept hoping that he would make it through to the end. He finally did. I think history will echo the view that he was a very complicated man with great talent, who was not a natural politician, who steeled himself in the quest for higher office, and those talents were accompanied by great flaws. President Nixon called me into his private cabin on Air Force One, and he said, well, we did some good things, but I let my country down, I let my family down, and I let myself down. And the tragedy is, there's no going back. And he just turned and looked out the window for the longest period of time, and nothing else was said. <laughs> 